Andrew Sluter is not saved. He's a damnable heretic. Andrew Sluter began to teach some very heretical things. You expose yourself as a heretic, a lying heretic. All right, welcome into another edition of the Laodicea Lookout Podcast. I feel like we're on the Backwoods Bible Broadcast again with that move. Uh, good to see you out. We're not wearing ties, so we we're not. We're, yeah, we're not on the broadcast. We're on the. Pod. I texted Randy this morning and I said I'm not wearing a tie because last time he did a podcast, which you're showing up a lot for these podcasts now. Mm-hmm. Um, Backwoods 2.0. Yeah, Backwoods 2.0. Um, <laughs> this one makes Andrew money is the only difference. <laughs> And does nothing for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just like it should be. Um, but I, he last time he showed up in a full suit, and I was like, dang it. I was just like wearing like a polo or something. We don't wear ties on the on the podcast. And uh, he shows up in a full suit, so I was like, I guess I have to change now. And I did. But I, t- I texted him this morning and said, I'm not wearing a tie. I so so like he showed up. Person. Yeah, he showed up like he came off the streets. Um, so anyway. This is how I dress when I don't wear a tie. But... Because my job, I'm usually wearing, a, not always a tie, but always a, a suit, collared shirt type deal. I'm always wearing a tie because of my job, too. God <laughs> called preacher. Anyway. Oh. oh. So Whatever. you're sitting in your recliner in your jogging clothes, <laughs> <laughs> typing away when I walk in. You're yeah. in that recliner. I love that recliner. It's comfortable. If you sat in that recliner, you'd always want to sit in it, too. Do you have a recliner at home? No. Oh, that's your problem. Yeah, I have a job. <laughs> I work for a living. <laughs> what do you do? Um, what are we going to talk about? I got my little list over there. Okay, so we went to Gatlinburg. I, I was going to say something before that. I Kevin was, Mann and first mention. No, 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 no. No, I, I was going somewhere with something, and then we started talking about your outfit. I don't know. But you're here. I don't, I don't know. know. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. In the flesh. Ooh. Um, so I went to Gatlinburg, and I, I wanted to show you guys. I got this. You know that hippie store, Earth Fair, or not Earth Fair? Um, well, that's a hippie store. Too. <laughs> yeah, it's <is>. a little <laughs> local hippie rest or uh, uh, grocery store. But Earthbound, you you might have an Earthbound. It's got all sorts of weird new age hippie stuff. But we go in there because sometimes they have some cool stuff. And we went in there, and they had this in Gatlinburg. Mm-hmm. We're gonna go and look at the one in Asheville because you want one of the. I bought. Um, well, I don't want to say anything else. Um, I I bought this one, and I bought another one, and. These were twenty nine dollars originally, and I got them for five ninety four a piece. That's amazing. That's a phenomenal deal. And I got this mm. alien mug. This was thirteen bucks, but I love this. I was gonna like use it to drink out of. I don't really drink like co- I don't drink coffee. I don't drink tea often, so um, I decided to use it as my you uh, what do you pencil or writing utensil holder there. And then this isn't mine, but I got Jake this. This is like really nerdy, but it's cool and he wanted it. And this is like right up his alley. It's a wolf chalice. Now I know somebody's gonna be like, oh, that really stands for like Satan and <laughs> Well, I'll see your alien mug stands more for Satan. Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna pitch a fit about this, you should really pitch a fit about the alien mug. Yeah. Uh that's Genesis six. Yeah, that's Genesis six. But anyway, I got him just this... intruded into things that you shouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. Well, I thought about getting like red paint and painting like a little circle with oh, a line over his face. That'd look terrible. Yeah, because I do have that shirt on <laughs> right now underneath this one. That, that needs to be the thumbnail right there. Um, but anyway, I got this chalice for Jake, and he's been like drinking sweet tea out of it. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool I mean, it's a cool little chalice. Drink out of it. There, there is, that is very true. Um, yeah, but we had a good time on our Gatlinburg trip. Um, we Very relaxing. We went to the aquarium at like 6.30 at night, hmm. like an hour and a half before it closed. There was nobody there. But you only got to stay there for an hour and a half? I mean, how long do you want to stay in the, in the aquarium? Dude, I love the aquarium. Oh, I do too. I mean, we looked. I mean, we took our time. Like we were not rushed at all. There was nobody in there. We were reading stuff. We went to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, and I read everything. Ripley, uh, what was his first name? Robert Ripley, I think. Mm-hmm. He was a cool man. He lived like back in the '30s. He traveled to 201 countries before, uh, like commercial airlines or anything. Hmm. 
boats and little charter airplanes and stuff. And it was he was a cool guy. I want to be the modern day Robert Ripley, but I can't draw. He's a cartoonist. Speaking of cartoons, we showed you. Now let me get these here. We showed you a guy by the name of Joshua McGregor. I don't know much about him. I, I know he watches our stuff. Uh, he used to be an Anderson guy. If I'm getting the story right, he used to be an Anderson guy. We showed you these on the 24 hour broadcast. He did a, a sketch of Stephen Anderson. His it's middle for, name wouldn't happen to be Bill, would it? <laughs> Joshua Bill McGregor. Yeah, <laughs> the tune and wrench. Um, th these are pretty. This is pretty good uh, yeah. of Stephen Anderson. The one I, of Roger I could that out of Stephen Anderson. Yeah, the one of Roger Jimenez just cracks me up. Though <laughs> I don't know why. That just it looks like Roger Jimenez, but it's just funny to me. Yeah. Um, but this one was really cool. He asked me if I wanted this one. He said, should I do one of Dr. Ruckman? I said, you should. And this one was pretty good. That's a picture of Dr. Ruckman, uh, an oil pastel. or I think he used oil pastel. I'm not an artist. I couldn't I couldn't even make it halfway look like this. So I've did seen one your chalk talks before. Yeah, they're bad. I'm not a good artist. So, the oh. boom I'm going to have him do one of me and you, Randy. Okay, yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, well, we got a lot to talk about. Um, we... So the Gatlinburg trip showed you all our cool little stuff we got. Kevin Mann. Kevin Mann was with us last night. We did not record that message, unfortunately. It, he talked good. about his testimony about how he lost his voice. Of course, he was the guy that wrote all the Number Nuggets books and the First Mention books and a bunch of different things. I bought six sets of his books, six complete sets. Um, so he is here. The First Mention stuff was just, it's unbelievable. And um, well, I liked his idea of what he did. Was that a secret? Oh, uh, not <laughs> well, because something I think he told a, us, he was like, I don't tell everybody this. No, 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 no. He was talking about something else. Oh, okay. Yeah, you misunderstood. No. So what he did, and this was genius. I don't know if anybody else that did this. He got his strong concordance. I think, yeah, mine's still down. I'm going to do this. You have to use a strong concordance, though, or any concordance you have. Um, you can use Young's. You can use Young's. Crudence. Crudence. Young for the, for the strong. Yeah. Dr., uh, Brother Young's Allen. For the young. And for, for the, the crude. crude. Yeah, that's what Brother Allen used to say. Um. But he went through in the very first place, you know, he would go start with Aaron. And the very first time Aaron's mentioned, he'd go and highlight it. And with every word in the Strong's Concordance, he would go through and highlight the first mention of it. And then if it was an only mention word, like, you know, Calvary, um, gosh, I'm blanking. I, there, he has a list of them. Is a... Uh... Eternity? Eternity, yeah, that's another one. Just the only time a word is mentioned, he would highlight it a different color. So, you know, he, he'd have all the first mentions highlighted in his Bible and all the only mentions. And that would just be a super good reference to do. It would. Um, but look how uh, thick that concordance is. Oh, I know. Man, that's, you can tell just from listening to him, he's put a lot of work into what he does. 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. He's got 13 books out. He released all of those at the same time. Just mm -hmm. boom. Um, so the only thing is he's got 13 books. <laughs> oh, he's got to get up there to 14 so he can get off that evil number. But anyway. Yeah, throw half of them away. <laughs> so you'll have six and a half. Yeah. <laughs> um, just shy of perfection. Yeah, praise God. So anyway, and he just has cool stuff about first mention and everything like that. Um, so we enjoyed having him last night. But the real reason why everybody clicked on this video, Randy. Yeah. This is what we're going to talk about now. Why don't you uh, lead the way here? And and because I don't want to say bad. I don't want to say, you know, I'm trying to behave. Okay. And people, I, I made a post two weeks ago that I'm trying to behave. And some of y'all have made it real difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, since then, every podcast is like, wow. Well, for good, I mean, we're called the Layout to See and Lookout. And so, like, for the first, you know, about six or seven episodes of Layout to See and Lookout, we were like, we went fishing, <laughs> uh, you know, just talking about random stuff. But there's been a lot of Layout to See happening the past month. Yeah. And, and this one's real bad. I actually, the worst. It, yeah. I, the worst. I, I made a comment about it because, you know, unfortunately, Heretic gets overused mm -hmm. so heavily. And so does, you know, putting people away, separating yourself from them. Uh, that gets so abused over every little thing that really, honestly, in the big picture, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But when things come along that actually do matter, then the word heretic really loses its power. And we've never. No, I don't just call no. out heretics and tell everybody they're a heretic because of 
you know, ultimately minor disagreements. And and I don't always call somebody a heretic just if like if they believe something that I deem heretical, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm just going to automatically brand them as a heretic because you know what I think may be heretical may not be that big of a deal in God's mind. Even though initially I may think it's a big deal, you know I'm not just going to label. Uh, I mean, for the longest time, um, you know, there were things that I believe that I don't agree with anymore. I don't believe them anymore. Mm-hmm. But I think you got to be real careful about labeling stuff as heresy. I know some guys will throw that word around a lot when referencing like end time stuff. Well, you know, if you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, then you're a heretic. Uh, I would be careful. I don't. I don't. I don't know if that. Con- you can be wrong and not a heretic. Yeah. Now, if, if you're against premillennialism, I would say you're a heretic. Yeah, that's heresy. Because I mean, it's plainly as plain as the nose right. on your face spelled out. Um, Replacement theology. That's heresy. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there there are some things heretical, but then uh, there are some things that are just wrong. You're just right. wrong ab- about. Yeah. I mean, you can be wrong about some things and not be a blatant heretic. Yeah, Randy's wrong about the gap, but we don't think he's a heretic. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that that's well, one. Of, that's you're wrong about First Peter chapter one, but I don't think you're a heretic. <laughs> Fair enough. So, I mean, there somebody being wrong doesn't constitute heresy, right? But what we're about to talk about this is, is heresy. This is blatant heresy, like to the point where we're going to name 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 a name. And we're going to mark him and avoid him. Well, I mean, Christians of the ages yeah. have considered this heresy. Santa Claus punched a dude in the face over this. And if Santa Claus <laughs> is punching you, I mean, how bad can you be? Yeah. So the story. So there was a guy back in the day. I don't have exact dates. Yeah. Do you know dates? No. It was uh, Arius, though. Yeah, it was Arius. He formed what is called Arianism. Mm-hmm. And Santa Claus, Sanny. Yeah. St. Nick. Old St. Nick. Uh, old old Papa Santa, Father <laughs> Christmas as he's called, um, who is also Satan. He punched <laughs> <laughs> who happens to be Satan. <laughs> who happens to be Satanus. Um, we're going on here, but there really was a guy named Saint Nick, and the story goes that he punched this dude in the face over his heresy at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. Oh, that would happen at the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> yeah. Well, Arius showed up to argue <laughs> his point, and Santa Claus was like, nope. <laughs> oh, and in all reality, they probably all were heretics. Well, there's an awesome there's an awesome meme. I generally do share this every year around Christmas. It's like the old-style drawing yeah. of Santa. And uh, I mean, like what you'd find in cave walls and stuff or in catacombs. And uh, he says underneath, I came to give presents to kids and punch heretics. And I just ran out of presents. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, it's Santa Claus punched this dude. And um, it was over what he believed about the deity of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And basically, he denied the deity of Jesus Christ or did not think he was on the same plane as God the Father. He believed that there was God the Father, and that he created Jesus Christ, and he, he also created the Holy Ghost, that it was just, you know, God the Father was the one true God. That oh my, that spooked me a little bit, Johnny. Um, whenever, whenever a phone rings during the service, I always say, that better be God calling. Um, and it never is. And it never is. It's never the Lord. Um what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ was a created being and that he is not God the Father, or excuse me, he is not um, uh, God, the Almighty God, the one true Jehovah God. So that's a problem. That's heresy. Mm-hmm. And the most recent person to, you know, believe this is a guy, a young man by the name of Joshua Alvarez. And Joshua Alvarez, I wouldn't say he's super well-known, but he's well-known around the Facebook world, especially in our circle. Um, He's the guy that I debated on the RVG versus the 1865 Spanish Bible. And, you know, he's a bright young man. I don't want to say too much about him because I don't want the focus to be on him as much because we do have to mark him, though. Yeah, he, he released a book a booklet, I should say. It's an it's, overpriced book. <laughs> yes, way. it is overpriced, but I, I bit the bullet and bought it. Um, it's 18 pages for, if you buy the Kindle version, three ninety nine, dollars and it's called 95 Theses Against the Trinity. 
and so it, it's it's bad. And there's a lot of arguments. A lot of arguments he uses. Divorce but not demoted is around sixty something pages, chock full of info. Chock full of info. And mine's mine's two ninety nine. Really? On um, yeah, the Kindle version is two ninety nine. Huh. Joshua's is eighteen pages long, maybe. I probably need to lower the price of mine. Yeah, I think mine's five ninety nine, but mine's bigger. Than Yours you. is definitely yeah. bigger. Your, yeah. Mine's like a hundred some pages. Yeah, yeah. Randy's is free if you want a free copy of it. It just, is. It is. Just it, ask him if people don't want to pay for it. Then I'll, I'll send you a free copy of my book. But it's no, PDF. Mine's right. six fifty if you get a hardback copy, and it's two ninety nine if you get it on Kindle. Joshua's is fifty cents cheaper. For a, I mean, his is way shorter than mine. Well, it's 18 pages. Huh? It's yeah. 18 pages. So it, it's only 50 cents cheaper than my hardback, but it's a dollar more than my Kindle version. Yeah, but but I should say, like, the focus of this broadcast is not to berate him for the price of his oh, yeah, yeah, Kindle sorry. book. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying, Joshua, if you're watching this, I know you probably will. It's a little overpriced, okay? <laughs> anyway, continue. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that heresy is way overpriced. You should buy the truth and sell it not. Yeah. Uh, but what it deals with, 95 theses, uh, thesis against the Trinity, and it's 95 miniature arguments on why the Trinity is not real and why Jesus Christ is not God. Right. And, I, I mean, it, when I say that, I mean, it almost feels dirty coming out of my mouth. Reading the stuff he read made me nervous just for my eyes to gaze upon it. <laughs> and and here's the thing. We are not casting stones at a the verbiage of the Trinity. We've we've been there, done that, got the t-shirts, you know, and all that kind of stuff. We've been attacked over our verbiage of the Trinity. You know, John Calvin killed Servetus over his wording of the Trinity. That's literally what it boiled down to. Um, so we've been there, done that. But in all of the controversy that surrounded, you know, us and the Trinity and all this, we are Trinitarian, the whole nine yards. But during all of that, nobody was denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Right. That's what the problem is here. We we were just essentially hashing out a, a mystery that cannot be understood. That cannot be understood. Yeah. And there's some guys that, you know, think that they've got a perfect grasp of the Trinity. That's fine. They've got one up on like every major, you know, Bible student in the past 2000 years. That's fine. But we, we were, there was never a question about the deity of any of the members of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So Joshua's denying the Trinity, number one. And then not only is he denying the Trinity, he's denying the deity of, of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Well, when you deny the Trinity, okay, you may have disagreements on how to exactly try and frame and uh, process the Trinity and teach the Trinity, right. whatnot. But if you deny that there is a Trinity, right, then you are basically going to be either an atheist or agnostic, a polytheist, because you then have to believe in multiple gods, right? Or um, multiple true gods. Yeah, multiple. We true believe gods. in we believe in multiple gods, and we'll get we'll dig into that. Yeah, and any Bible believer does. Right. So you have to believe in multiple true gods, or you have to do as Joshua did and deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly, and and that's where he's at, and we have his book here. Um, we, there's 95 theses, theses, how do you say, is it theses, 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 <laughs> theses. there are 95 theses and, um, against the Trinity and we're not going to cover all 95. We're not even going to cover. People cut a slack because we're from the mountains of North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to pronounce this stuff. That's true. Um, so, uh, what we've got is, um, just a few of them. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not, we don't have a lot. We've got a few, maybe about what, 10? Uh, yeah. 10 three, to 15? Six, yeah. And some of them are lumped together. Some of them are going to be like, you know, collective, collectively debunked. But we're going we're gonna to talk about a few of them. Um, they're all heresy, obviously, because they're all trying to disprove the deity of Jesus Christ. But some of them, he's just say, he's some of them, he's stating things that are true, but he's, he's just leading you along. Right. So I, I'll give you an example of a broad swath of those. It's when he deals with 
Jesus Christ in his humanity. Right. Now, if you were reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, then you could walk away with some of what Joshua is teaching and, and what Ar classic Arianism teaches. Sure. If you just have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because there's no doubt about it, Jesus took on himself the form of a servant. Right. He he was, you know, made a little lower than the angels. He was, um, you know, submitted himself to the Father, all this stuff. But all of those verses are dealing with his humanity. Yes. Every one of them. Nobody denies that. But just because in his humanity he did those things does not mean that he was less than God. Right. It, the classical term for it is the hypostatic union. Right. That he was fully God and fully man. Mm hmm So um, we're going, again, we, well, there's no way that we're going to be able to delve into all 95, nor would we want to, uh, nor would you watch it. All right. I mean, I don't know. There's probably some weirdos out there that watch all 95, but we're not going to do that because we want to go eat. Um, but you got them written down there, Randy. Yeah, Let's so just, the we're first just one is tackle. number 17. Number 17. Yeah, I'll read it while you're getting there. Okay. I'm already there. <laughs> there. Uh, the biblical term God simply means a mighty one, Psalm 82, 1. And thus, in a sense, there are God's many, according to the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 8, 5. But as for the one true God who is eternally existent, Isaiah 57, 15, and is not created, that role fits the Father alone, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. This renders null and void the supposed proof texts of Jesus' deity when he is occasionally called God, John 20, 28, since he is simply being referred to as a mighty one. Now, a lot of what this book is predicated upon is that anytime Jesus is called God, mm -hmm. that he's not actually God. Yeah. I mean, that is the truth. That, it. it really is. That That's not really even an oversimplification. No, it's really not. And, and the proof text that he has... Oh, and, and just to tear up everybody's nerves, I'm using an original. Well, not an original, original, but a fact. Hey, he's or, got the originals. I've right got here. the originals right here. Praise God! I've got the uh, I've got a copy of an original King James Bible, and I can read it just fine. Anyway, uh, but the whole the whole proof text that he uses, I mean, John seventeen three is probably in here enough to you know whatever choke a mule. But John seventeen three is the text that he uses. To basically, he builds his entire book on John 17, 3, essentially. And uh, what that, the only bad thing about the original <laughs> is I have to do math with Roman numerals to figure this thing out. I'm bad at math. All right, here it is, uh, 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So that's the whole basis that nothing else in the Bible can contradict that verse that this verse clearly says that the only true God is God the Father, and that every other verse must be interpreted through the light of that. And see, I, I'm not going to say that that is an obscure verse, because it, it fits perfectly when you put the other verses in with it. Exactly. But to try to imagine one verse obliterating 30? 30 clear. 30 clear verses? Yeah. Uh, it, it just does not work that way in Bible study and systematic theology. And so him using that one verse as the lens for seeing all the other verses, uh, that's one of the things that will lead to this type of heresy. Yeah. So, so point 17, thesis 17, is that every time that Jesus, you know, and he says the, uh, the occasional times when Jesus says, <laughs> The occasional times that Jesus is referred to as God, um, that it's just it's it's referencing God the Father, and and we'll and he he deals with how he explains that. Yeah. Uh, so number eighteen, number eighteen, it goes into that just sure. a little bit. Yeah, he says in John twenty twenty eight, specifically Jesus is called Thomas's God, only in the context of the Father being Jesus God. Verse seventeen. Thus, the Father is a distinct and a higher God than Jesus Christ, and Jesus is not the one true Jehovah God. So, to put, just in case you didn't follow that, um, because Thomas only called Jesus his God because God the Father was Jesus' God. Mm -hmm. And that makes about as much sense as, you know, a screen door on a submarine. Yeah, John 20, 28, 
uh, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Nope. <laughs> I mean, basically. Nope. Well, Schofield's note on this, the deity of Jesus Christ is declared in Scripture. And he has, you know, several things written down under that. But nobody can read this and come away thinking this unless you're interpreting it through a very bad lens. Yeah. I mean, to add the fact, well, the only reason he's called God there is because God was God was his God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is I mean, is God your God, Randy? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Randy is my God. That doesn't make any sense. No. Um, it, it's it's really bad. It's really bad, and it's faulty interpretation. And and but this is what you have to do with heresy. All right. Let's move along. Okay. Let, let us hurry, lest we not finish. All right. Hebrews one eight. The devil just walked in here. That door just opened. Hey, I was telling you last night. A lot of times we attribute the spooky things to devils, like you know, right. creepy stuff. But one thing we know is demonic is bad doctrine. Bad. Doctrines. Doc, first, first Timothy four one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter time, shum, uh, shum, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yeah. So uh, our next one is, uh, let's see, number nineteen. 19. It takes us to Hebrews one eight. It says in Hebrews one eight, where Jesus is likewise called O God. It is in the context of the Father. As being Jesus God, higher than him, verse 9, and of Jesus only being God in the sense of being a most mighty one, Psalm 45, 6, and 3. Here's the problem. You've got God, the Father, talking to God, the Son, and calling him, O God, and saying, uh, and you're you're there. Read read Hebrews one eight. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So, and then read verse number nine. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. I don't understand how you can't see the fact that both God the Father and God the Son, they're obviously both being called God here. And we do have mighty ones mentioned as gods. All right, we, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later because we, we have to cover it later on in, in, in our rebuttal here. But to say that Jesus Christ is not the mighty God, because Isaiah 9, 6 clearly says that he is the mighty God. God, not just a mighty one. He's a mighty God or the mighty God, I should say, to see and his throne. If, if, if God, the father is a higher God and Jesus is a lesser God, then why would he say that thy throne is exalted? Mm -hmm. um, no, that's not what it says here. I'm sorry. Where does it talk about the exalted? We'll have to look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my verses. We looked at probably 25 to 30 verses. Yeah. Well, let, let me just introduce this. I was going to save it for the end, but it'll okay. fit perfectly here. Okay. Verse 6 of Hebrews 1. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and mm -hmm. let all the angels of God worship him. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself in Matthew 4.10 said to only worship the Lord God. Right. And so scripturally, biblically, if you worship anything that is not God, it is idolatry. The one true God. Yes, uh, let me read that reference because uh, John 4.10 is, is really Matthew powerful. Matthew 4.10. Oh, is it Matthew 4.10? Well, there might be a good one, John 4.10. It's all good, but I think the one you're looking for is Matthew 4.10. Oh, no, I think I'm I think I'm thinking John 4. Okay. Um, where it says, um, uh, Matthew 4, or, I'm sorry, John 4.21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor, ye, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know what? Excuse me, ye worship, ye know not what we know that we worship. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus Christ multiple times is worshiped in the scripture. 
meaning that he is God. And the context here... I mean, the example is Thomas that we just read. Exactly. Exactly. And then you have Matthew 14. Yeah, well, that was Jesus telling Satan to only worship the Lord God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the temptation. So, uh, and I've got it here. Uh, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So I don't understand how you... And he never addresses, as far as we could tell, I didn't read it in there. He never addresses Jesus Christ being worshipped. I don't think so. I don't think so. If it's in there, we may have overlooked it. There's 95 of them. You forget what you read sometimes. I never see him dealing with Jesus being worshipped because you only worship the Lord. That's right. God. All right. What's our next one here? So next one is number 20. In John 1, 1, where the Apostle John writes that the word was God, a reference to Jesus Christ, this cannot contradict the doctrinal statement of Christ himself in John 17, 3. Again, that's what we're saying, interpreting the rest of them through that lens. Right. That the Father alone is the only true God. Compared to Hebrews 1, 3, Colossians 1, 15, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Jesus is not God himself, but God's image or visible representation. Jesus is only Jehovah God in the sense that he represents God, that just as when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that that rock was Christ, this means that the rock in the wilderness of Exodus 17, 6 represented Christ spiritually. Well, <laughs> that's the problem, Brother Randy. <laughs> we believe that rock was Christ. Well, I mean, it kind of says that. Yeah. That's the only rock and roll I believe in. <laughs> that, there was a rock and it rolled with those Jews. Well, you know, to walk away, though, from John 1.1 1, 1 because of John 17.3, mm-hmm. the plain teaching of John 1.1 1, 1 is that Jesus, the Word, was God. Yeah, and the Word was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. I think that says that somewhere else in the Bible, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we're definitely going to get there. We're definitely going to get there. Okay, so the next set of these we're taking as a, a lump together. This is 21, 22, and 23. It says, Jesus' statement in John eight fifty eight that before Abraham was, I am, is explained by the scriptures themselves in Exodus 23, 20 through 21, and Galatians four fourteen. That Jesus, rather than being Jehovah, was the angel whom Jehovah sent and who had his name in him to represent the I am. 22. When the Apostle John states that Jesus made himself equal with God, this is not to be understood of numeric equality, as though Jesus was the one God with the Father, nor of metaphysical equality, as though Jesus during that time was in full possession of divinity, but of an equality of authority in the context. And then number 23, when the Apostle Paul states that Jesus was equal with God in Philippians 2.6, this too refers to an equality of authority, not of numeric being nor metaphysical nature, since it is contrasted with Christ humbling himself as a servant rather than being a master. All right, so go ahead and give your thoughts on this, and then I'll, I'll give my thoughts on it. Okay, so just to cap off number 23. It's going to take me that long to find John <laughs> 10 with these Roman numerals. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, as far as his equality with God, so he, it, I believe it looks like he's saying that Jesus shared an equality with God until he took on himself the form of a servant. But that kind of flies in the face of what he believes if Jesus is a created being. Right. Well, and it also doesn't make sense if he's saying, and and again, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes, you know, when you're reading things, what a per, you know, sometimes you have to dig into what a person believes because mm-hmm. their writings aren't clear. Okay. Um, this is not to be understood. Uh, so forth and so on. Um, during Jesus. Okay. As though Jesus during that time was in full possession of divinity but of an equality of authority in the context, verse 27. So if there's an equality of authority, and that's it, or if somehow that that was lost during his earthly ministry, here's the problem. John chapter 10, and I'm sure, you know, oh, you're misrepresenting, you know, whatever. Well, then just write it a little better then. 
because I'm not I'm not entirely sure what he's trying to get at with this here in the verses. Okay, because in uh, John chapter number ten and verse number twenty nine, I'm sorry, verse number thirty, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews, verse thirty one, took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. I, I just don't understand here. I mean, the Jews understood what Jesus was saying. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Thomas did. Thomas did. John did. John did. <laughs> Unfortunately, Joshua doesn't. <laughs> and and I'm not trying to be ugly or cute, but I'm I'm just saying these Jews understood what Jesus was doing. He was making himself God. Mm -hmm. He said, "I and my Father are one." So uh, you know, with this whole thing, well, he's just you know he's just saying he has equal authority. Or, no, no, no. They clearly knew what he was saying. He wasn't just saying. You know, who in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So putting Jesus Christ and you know the Son and the Father on the same plane, Jesus didn't think that that was any type of robbery. Right? Right. But according to Arianism, Jesus was obviously below the Father. He was a lesser God, mm -hmm. just like a Jehovah's Witness teaches. So how does that make sense? It doesn't. Right. Okay, so number 26. There are many scriptures which detail exactly how the Father is greater than Christ, all of which stand in direct opposition to the Trinitarian teaching from Rome's seven ecumenical councils. The first, in no particular order, is that the Father sent the Son into the world, and the Son didn't come by himself. Did we talk about that one? Well, it's written down. It's written down. I don't remember us talking about well, that. Well, I, I think we kind of stole our thunder at the beginning because we did mention how that Christ did submit himself to the Father mm -hmm. and how he did take on himself the form of a servant. So we're not negating that as factual in the Scripture, but you have to look outside of you know the, the handful of verses you're going to present in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even a few in John, mm -hmm. to try and argue that Jesus had no divinity to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next one we skip to 63. And, and arguably, this is the greatest proof text on Trinity in a King James Bible. In 1 John 5, 7, in the AV 1611, is found the strongest supposed proof text that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all the one God. But the verse itself never says these three are one God, but only these three are one. The immediate context, verses 6 and 8, shows that these three are one in agreement of testimony, not in substance or essence or a singular being. You want to comment first? Go ahead. Well, you had okay. some really good stuff when we were talking last night about this. Yeah. Okay, so if you can find this. If I, if I can find First John, though, it's right here. Yeah. Um, well, First John's not the hard part. It's deciphering yeah. them Roman numerals. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm good up to the X, and then once you start adding <laughs> X and then afterwards. No, I, I'm good then. It's when you start adding the L's and the C's. and. <laughs> Have you ever studied the words that end in X? <laughs> yeah. Box, box. <laughs> Depending where you're from, socks. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, this is where, okay. So he wants to talk about the AV 1611 being the final authority. Da, 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 da. Okay. Well, so far he's added things to scriptures. Well, that's just talking about them being one in authority. That's just talk. Okay. This is where you really start adding, where he really starts adding stuff. What well, says that these three are one. Um, this, is, this is talking about that these three are in agreement of testimony. Well, that's the problem. Verse number six, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For thee, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, 
and these three are one. If you're going to say that these three are just in agreement, then you're going to have a hard time with verse number eight. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. He's trying to say that the agreement, oh, well, all it's talking about is just agreement in verse number seven. Well, no, the agreement is found in verse number eight, not verse number seven. Do not add, excuse me, words to the scriptures here. Verse number seven says, these three are one. Verse number eight says, these three agree in one. To say that the Trinity is denied, and, you know, to say that 1 John 5, 7 has nothing to do with the Trinity is absolute nonsense. It's saying that these three beings are one. But then it's saying that these three entities in verse number eight agree in one. The spirit and the water and the blood are not one. They just agree in one. And so you are doing some major damage to the wording of scripture when you try to make that fit. And that's exactly how every Mormon and every Jehovah, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't just don't have that verse in their Bible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like all the modern translations, the New World Translation. But the Mormons that do have 1 John 5, 7 in their Bible, uh, that's exactly the same argument they use there. So anyway. Brian Edwards. Oh, well, I, don't, I can't speak in his life. We're, yeah. Sorry. I don't, even, I don't even know why I said it's that. It's his fault. I don't even know why I said that. They get brought up because of him. It is my fault. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. I'm guilty. <laughs> Please forgive me. Okay, that's not even this context or topic. Okay, uh, so number 68 through 70 and 73. When right. Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16 says that God was manifest in the flesh, and, and this one, you talk about... You talk about resting yeah. the scripture. Yeah, resting the scripture. That's, that's biblical. Yeah, it is. Um, when Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16 says that God was manifest in the flesh, this is not referring to Jesus as God. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, but, but give the explanation that he gives. Okay, well, I'm on, I'm on my way to it. Okay. Okay. This is where it gets weird. But rather to the Father. In the incarnation, Jesus plainly said that he that hath seen me has seen the Father. I agree with that. <laughs> it was the Father, therefore, who was manifest in the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is the image or visible representative of the Father. Do you want me to keep reading all of them? No, let's, let's stop right okay. there. That's modalism, Patrick. <laughs> that is. <laughs> That is modalism. Like that is now. I'm not saying that I disagree with that with that statement. Even Dr. Ruckman in his theological study says that God the Father was Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh. Okay. No, Jesus Christ was I, God I'm, the Father. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, switch that. Jesus, or God the what? Well, Jesus Christ was God the Father manifest in the and flesh. If you're modalist, they're both right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It don't matter exactly. how you say it. It don't matter how you say it. Okay. So literally, what Joshua is giving here is a leans towards a modalist interpretation of these verses. But he's an Arian. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, well, when it was God the Father manifested in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Well, it was Jesus Christ, though. Well, he's the image of the invisible God. Well, we agree with that. Mm -hmm. So if it was God, if God the Father was in Jesus Christ and was manifested in Jesus Christ, then how are you going to say that Jesus Christ was a lesser God than him? Mm -hmm. That don't make no sense. Impossible. It literally, he's literally saying that the Bible uses the terminology God, God the Father, being manifested in the flesh. And we're gonna and we'll read on. Yeah. But it talks about justified in the spirit, seen of angels, all this stuff that happened to Jesus, he said actually happened to God the Father. Yeah, okay. And that makes the argument even worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when first Timothy 3:16 says that God was justified in the spirit. This refers to the Father being declared righteous in remitting the sins committed by the Old Testament saints when God set forth Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And the reference he gives is Romans 3, Romans 3.25. That ain't got nothing to do with being justified in the Spirit. Okay. Nothing. That's the baptism of Jesus is when he's justified in the Spirit. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's plain. Yeah, yeah. You, okay. All you got to do is study that out. Anyway. 70. When 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was seen of angels, this again refers to them seeing him through Christ 
his representative, since Christ said, he that seeth me seeth him that sent me in John 12, 45. My conclusion to that was maybe because Jesus was God. Nope. Representative. <laughs> well, here, let, let's, let's call a timeout right here. Okay. Okay. Me and Lauren are one, are one flesh. That's what the Bible says. When you're married to somebody, you're one flesh. Okay. There is a oneness between me and Lauren that I don't have with anybody else. Now, you cannot, though, say of Lauren, if you've seen Lauren, you've seen, if you've seen Andrew. That's not true, okay? She is way better looking than I am. You cannot say that if you've seen me, you've seen Lauren. So there is a oneness there where we are one, but there is not, I, we cannot make that statement. Well, you know, if you've seen Randy, you've seen me. Like me, his wife, not me. All right? Right. And my uh, wife's name is me, am I? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So when you've seen Randy, you've seen me, or when you've seen me, you've seen Randy. That's not, we can't say that. But Jesus Christ could say that about his father. There was a oneness there that was so close to where we can't comprehend that. And so when Joshua says here, well, you know, they were, you know, if, you, if you've seen Jesus Christ, you've seen the father because he was the representative of the father. Wait a second. I thought that he was the father, according to his interpretation of 1, John 3, or 1 Timothy 3, 16, that he was manifested in the son. It, it, it really just starts muddying the waters. Mm -hmm. So anyway, continue well, on. There, there is a draw of intellectual minds to doctrine they can't explain. Yeah. I don't know why, but there is. Uh, let's continue. When 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was preached unto the Gentiles, the reference is to the Father, who was preached along with Jesus Christ by <laughs> Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. The pro okay, here's the problem. The last one, and this is where it really gets bad, when he was received up into glory. Yeah. Because it's obviously, a, I have a message I preach on 1 Timothy 3.16, the mystery of godliness. It's a chronological outlook on Jesus' life. Sure it is. Okay? He was manifest in the flesh. That's his birth. Mm -hmm. He was justified in the, uh, uh, justified in the spirit. Yeah. Uh, that's his baptism. He was seen of angels. That was his temptation. All right, that was also the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he was uh, preached on in the uh, preached unto the Gentiles. That's Matthew fifteen. He is believed on in the world. That's his entire ministry. All right, and then he was received up into glory. That's his ascension. It is a chronological view of the things that happened in the physical life of Jesus. Okay, when what he is stating is that oh he was preached on in the Gentiles. Well, that happened during Paul's ministry. You know, it was fulfilled in, in, during Paul's ministry. Well, no, that destroys the chronological view of 1 Timothy 3, 16. Mm -hmm. And it's also just a big stinking stretch to, to say that. Okay, here's the, here's the last one, 73. Okay. When 1 Timothy 3, 16 says that God was received up into glory. Yes. Even this last detail fits perfectly the Father. Oh, you missed 72. Well, we, we weren't supposed to do 71. We weren't supposed to do 71? No, we're doing 68 through 70 and then 73. Oh, okay, fair yeah. enough, fair enough. So, yeah. Um, Same argument in, in point 72. Yes. Um, because the Lord Jesus Christ, well, let me just restart that. Okay. When 1 Timothy 3.16 says that God was received up in the glory, even this last detail fits perfectly the Father, because as the Lord Jesus Christ said, he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, John 13.20. God the Father was received up in the glory by the angels when they received up Christ who was the representative of the Father. In no case does 1 Timothy 3.16 refer to Jesus the Son as God, but to the Father only. I just... You, you cannot read 1 Timothy 3.16 and walk away with this. Unless a dip... I'm, I'm, I'm not being like... I, I don't know. This is blunt. But unless the devil is thinking, whispering this in your ear. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, Joshua mentioned in a post when he was promoting this 18-page uh, work he put out that a still small voice whispered to him. And I, I don't know how serious he was about that. If he, if he was just saying that, as you know, we preachers do tend to say things. Like, they seem pretty serious. Get under, the, get under the spout where the glory comes out. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff like that, but he said, 
and he referenced uh, First Elijah, Kings. First yeah. Kings, that a still small voice spoke to him about this and confirmed it to be true. So, yeah, to, to I mean, and he's saying he's trying to make the cross reference between received up into glory and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Um, the only person that's receiving here that he's saying is that they were received by the angels. The angels are receiving him, receiving God the Father is what he said. And I'd have to go back and look to find the wording. I don't think it ever talks about angels receiving him. A cloud receives him, but not an angel. So I don't know. It, it's I, I just don't understand how you walk away from 1 Timothy 3.16, like you said, with that interpretation. Yes. All right, finally, let's read on here. Finally, number 86 is the last one we'll deal with. The fact of the matter is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the parable of the vineyard proved that he was the father's one son, his well-beloved, during, yet, I don't quite understand his wording, during in the days of the Old Testament prophets who were martyred by the Jewish people under the law. What and, point are we on? I'm sorry. 86. Okay. And since Hebrews 1, five equates Christ being from the father, with the time that he became God's son, then Christ begetting in Psalm 2-7 on a certain day must have occurred before his virgin birth. So basically, let's just give a, a, a quick, uh, whatever you want to call it, recap of what Arianism teaches and what Joshua believes. They teach that sometime before anything, before the creation of the world, that Jesus Christ was created by God the Father. They believe that he was begotten by God the Father at, at some point, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of your reformers and a lot of your Calvinists believe in the eternally begotten Son of God. They somehow, I call it Arianism light. They believe that sometime in eternity past that, you know, Jesus was begotten by God the Father, eternally begotten, but yet he was still co-eternal with the Father, yet he was begotten, and that don't make no sense. So I, I, I call Arianism light, what these what the Reformers and a lot of these Reformed theologians believe now, okay? And they believe that he was created, he was the first person to ever be created by God, that, that Jesus Christ was the first created thing ever. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I just kind of wanted to recap. Did I cut no, you off? No, you didn't cut me off. Okay, out. perfect. All <laughs> yeah. right, beautiful. Then I'll let the church roll on. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and so what Joshua is saying, you have, what, what do you have here? You have Hebrews 1? So Hebrews 1, 5 is, is his proof text. Right. And he is using this to say that Christ begetting in Psalm 2, 7 on a certain day must have occurred before his virgin birth. Right. Well, the, the text, let me read Hebrews 1, 5. It says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This is a direct cross-reference to Acts 13. Well, hang on. Let's, we'll get there. Okay. But let's talk about first the fact that when was Jesus Christ considered the begotten son? Okay. All right. Luke 1, verses 35 and 36 could not be any plainer why Jesus Christ is called the Son. Now, let, let's talk about this really quick while we're going there. No doubt, Psalms 2, Daniel 3, and Proverbs 30, Jesus Christ is called the Son of God. Okay, he's called the Son in Acts 2, I'm sorry, in Psalms 2 and Proverbs 30, and he's called the Son of God in, in uh, Daniel 3. Okay, nobody denies that. He's obviously called the Son in the Old Testament before his incarnation. But Luke 1, 35 and 36 clearly tells, and really I think it might just be Luke 1, 35, clearly tells us why he's called the Son. Yeah. You got that? I do. All right, go ahead and read that. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yeah. Philip Parker used to always say, whenever you see a therefore, you go back and see what it's there for. <laughs> I, I've said that about 20 times teaching through Hebrews this year. Yeah. yeah. So because the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow Mary and impregnate her or whatever. I know some people don't like that verbiage, whatever you want to call it. 
It's going to put the seed of God in her. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It is obvious that he's called the Son of God because he is begotten of the Father, and it takes place here. What Joshua tries to do is he tries to deny that in Hebrews 1, he tries to deny that that's the, that's the, the virgin birth. Here's the problem with that. Hebrews 1 is a connection of two verses, because he mentions later on, we, we probably should read a few more of these points so that people kind of know what we're dealing with. You read 86. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see here. You it, want me to go to 87? Well, it, I, I, yeah, kind of, I guess. Let, let's deal with a, it's kind of hard because he, he these points are not like different points. He, it's almost like he'll take a section and just say, Here's point this, and because this, it's he he try he's leading it leading along with these points. Yeah, um, kind of this whereas yeah, dot, and the, whereas and they're leading together. So we have to read multiple points. So you can get the whole thought. Go ahead and read eighty seven. Okay, the day Christ was begotten by the Father is said to be before the creation of the heavens and the earth, in Proverbs eight twenty two through twenty six. A statement made by Christ as the wisdom of God. This proves the truth of Arianism. Yeah. And he also says in, in point 91 and 92, he says that Paul himself confirms this in Colossians 1.15, where he calls Christ the firstborn of every creature. In point 92, this cannot be taken to mean either that Christ is merely the ruler of all creation, nor that this refers to the virgin birth and him being the firstborn of every new creature after Calvary. First, in the same chapter, Paul uses of the term firstborn is in clear distinction from Christ being the head. So he's trying to say that, you know, he's the firstborn of every creature and that, you know, he's the beginning of the creation of God, all that kind of stuff. And that this begotting or this begetting, excuse me, happened sometime before the creation of the world. Here is the problem. You take Acts chapter number two, or excuse me, uh, Psalms chapter number two and verse number seven. It is clearly quoted in Hebrews one when he bringeth his for, or when he bringeth uh, the only begotten into the world, that is a clear reference to the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into the world, and he was born of a virgin. The Holy Ghost literally begat Jesus. He was begotten of Mary. You can read that in uh, Matthew chapter number one. A lot of people miss this little nugget of truth here in Matthew chapter number one. You know what I'm talking about? You 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 might. No, I was reading Proverbs eight, uh, okay. which was his cross reference. And, okay, and we should probably double back on that. Okay, yeah, yeah, we will. But in, in Matthew chapter number one, you have so and so begat so and so so and begat so and so so and so begat so and so. But then in verse number um, sixteen, it says, "And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ." He was born of Mary because he was begotten. G Mary didn't begot him. She was, or he was begotten of the Holy Ghost. Begat, yeah. Beget, beget, <laughs> beget. Begot. I think, is beget a word? I think beget. It okay. Beget? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. A baguette? We're going to eat some of those later, maybe. All right. But anyway, that's the nugget of truth there. He's begotten by the Holy Ghost. He was begat by the Holy Ghost. And that is clear from Luke chapter number one. That's why he's called the Son of God. But let's double back to what you were talking about. Well, the reference he brings up in Proverbs 8 to say that uh, Jesus was born before the world mm -hmm. is in context referring to wisdom. Right. Well, he tries to say that the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and that's 1 Corinthians one twenty four is the cross reference he gives that. He says this proves Arianism. Well, here's the problem, though. If we're going to say that that is referring to Jesus Christ as being somehow eternally begotten or, you know, as the first creation of God, here's the problem. He never, ever deals with the clear fulfillment of Acts 2, I mean, of, of Psalms 2. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It is a double fulfillment. It was fulfilled, first of all, at the virgin birth. There's no, I don't, I don't understand how you get around that. Acts two, this day have I begotten thee. You know when he brought when he bringeth his uh, when uh, when he bringeth his son into the world. Hebrews one, 
I don't understand. And also the angels of God worship him. It's clearly referring to God being manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. But this is where it gets really, really interesting and really just blows his whole idea of this happening. And he doesn't even deal with Acts 13 in this book. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it at all. Go ahead and read Acts 13. What is it? Okay. Verse 33. 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So this is clearly a reference to the resurrection. Clearly a reference to the resurrection. This is a double fulfillment. I taught on this in the Bible Institute. You have verses that have a double fulfillment in the Bible. For example, over there in Zechariah 12, it says, and they shall look upon him whom they've pierced. All right? And, you know, and, and, and the tribes of the earth shall mourn and all that kind of stuff. Well, John 19, that verse is said to be fulfilled at the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. But then it's mentioned again being fulfilled in Revelation chapter number one at the second advent. Mm -hmm. Peter says that Joel 2 was being fulfilled at Pentecost. But we know that Joel 2 will not ultimately be fulfilled until revelation all right the day of the lord there are and we could go through multiple places where there are old testament prophecies that have a double fulfillment and this is one of them he never deals with acts 13 in his book and that is that's even clearer than <laughs> than hebrews chapter number one that's even clearer than the virgin birth the fact that psalms 2 is dealing with his resurrection you cannot say that Jesus Christ was begotten at some point before. And this goes hand in hand with Colossians chapter number one. Feel free to interject at any time. Well, I just, I got the Kindle version of the book and I looked up Acts 13 and it says no results for Acts 13 were found. <laughs> no results. Yeah. He has no results for Acts 13. I mean, it it's plain, it's clear. And, you know, Hebrews 1 is an incredibly strong verse for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to twist it that way is just, it's a horrible shame. We see Christ worshiped there in one six as God. We see this great cross reference to Acts 13 uh, from verse number five. We see God calling Jesus God. Mm -hmm. uh, God the Father referring to Jesus as God in verse one eight. You just, you can't get around this. And he tries to say that, let me read point 85, the supposed connection of Psalms 2-7 with the virgin birth. I have somebody that calls me all the time from Utah. I don't know who it is. I just declined them. Mormons. Mormons. Uh, no, they don't call me no more. Uh, the supposed connection of Psalms 2-7 with the virgin birth in Hebrews 1, 5, and 6 is refuted by a slow reading of the text, which actually states that the virgin birth, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, was prophesied with the scripture and let all the angels of God worship him, Psalms 97, 7, not with Psalms 2, 7. Well, the problem is, is that the two verses are combined in Hebrews 1. Psalms 2, 7 and Psalms 97, 7 are put together like many times the New Testament does, takes two different scriptures and puts them together. Mark 1, 2 is a beautiful example of that. Takes two separate prophecies, one from Malachi and one from Isaiah, puts them right smack dab together and talks about John the Baptist. All right. But it, it's clear. I think anybody with one eye and half a brain can see that Psalms two has a fulfillment at the resurrection. Like there's no denying it. And I think it's real interesting that he completely leaves this out of his book booklet. And then we'll look at one more place. Bakito. Huh? Bakito. Bakito. Yeah. Bakito. What is Bikito? Well, in, in Spanish, Ito, the diminutive. Oh, it, it would be Bebito. Yeah. Well, I, oh, being facetious. Oh, okay. <laughs> baby book. The little baby book. Um, <laughs> this will be the last place. Randy's closing his Bible, so he's obviously done. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're at the end of the list. Yeah, well, they're over. So, so it's obviously resurrection. Yeah. But this is the last place. Colossians 1, where he talks about, you know, he's the, you know, Revelation 3.14 is the beginning of the creation of God and he's the firstborn of every creature. It's interesting, and I'm looking for it again. I didn't see it. Can you look at Colossians, see if he has Colossians 1.18 in there anywhere? Because Colossians 1.15 says, 
who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. People say, well, there it is. He's the firstborn of every creature. Does he have Colossians 1.18? No, one fifteen. You could probably just do Colossians. You could probably just put in one uh, well, colon eighteen. Yeah, no, he's got a lot of one fifteens, but no one eighteen. Okay, because and and I mean I know why because Colossians one eighteen just three verses down from verse fifteen, which he says he's the he's the firstborn of every creature. That's talking about the creation of Jesus Christ. He was a created being, a created God by God the Father. Colossians one eighteen clearly says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the, the dead, dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This is clearly talking about the resurrection of Christ. When it talks about Jesus being the firstborn, he's the firstborn from the dead. When he's begotten of the Father, that's talking about his resurrection in, in Acts 13. So, and that I mean, that cross-references beautifully. And I got that right out of my 1611 <laughs> King 1611 James Bible. 1611 KJV. I'm done talking. Randy, close, close out here for us. Close in a word of prayer. Close in a word of prayer. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know what else to, there is to say. Uh, if you got the book, which I don't recommend, but if you did, it's it's if packed you full of heresy. The book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and we, the ones we got were some of the ones, I feel like it's it's all obvious heresy, but these were some of the ones that may not be as obvious to the average reader. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you, read these and what we said and then also um realizing that christ did submit himself to the father and he took on himself the form of a servant uh during his earthly ministry you're not going to have any problems with this but i I do believe that we're going to see more and more of this and i would just encourage any preachers who are watching to return to systematic theology teaching doctrine and doing so within the meta narrative of dispensationalism. Yes. And if you do that, then you should see less of this happen at your church. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So there it is, folks. Have you? Do you see my face right here? Do you see how very much red? Very red. But this side is not. That's my rosacea flaring up. Oh. Um, yeah. Or you're having a stroke. Or I'm having a stroke. It's probably because I drank one of these highly caffeinated energy drinks. <laughs> or because you read these theses. Or because I read these theses. My blood pressure just threw. But only on this side. Only on the left side. Um, but anyway, there it is, folks. Th- this is this is Laodicea right here. This is apostasy. This is people departing from the faith. Did you have a, a funny comment? Well, it's because your face is red. A minute ago, I felt my arm twinge a little. Yeah. I'm having a heart attack. You're having a stroke over having to read this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, you know, when when you if you may have to listen to this, you know, once or twice, you may have to pause and look at the scriptures, whatever you need to do. But uh, it's a good study. It's a good. And you study. should know these things. You should. Um, and these. This are, is a second preacher i know now granted the other one didn't write a book about it but this is but a, he made videos he made videos should we the, call his name i don't know because i didn't watch all the videos i'll just say this as of right now this is the second baptist preacher i know to fall into a similar heresy now his wasn't as bad as this yeah his was bad but his wasn't as bad it was bordering i'll just say it like this there's never been a time that jesus wasn't god no and this guy was saying that he laid aside his godhood, if I'm interpreting what he said correctly. I, I think. Yeah. I for sure wasn't going to watch the video. Well, see, I, I don't know enough to call his name. Yeah. But um, but that is, that's what I was told by his, I think, still his pastor. I don't know. That's what I was told by his pastor. Yeah. So it, it's bad. This, this kind of stuff shouldn't be happening to, to any student in the Bible. And I yeah. just encourage you to equip yourself with doctrine. Because we're in a bad day where doctrine's been forsaken. Yeah. Will not endure. Will Sound not doctrine. endure it. Nope. Yeah. So anyway, there it is, folks. This has been another Laodicean Lookout podcast. Be on the lookout because we are in Laodicea. God bless you is my prayer.